Okay, picking up where we left off, this is our fourth video, and we continue our quick tour of the axioms and rules in axiomatic semantics. And so our next one is the conditional rule, and this is what we use to say something about the correctness of if-then-else statements. All right, and again, schematically, we can consider uh, our precondition Q and our postcondition R and the code in the middle, right, is if E, then S1, else S sub 2. And so our question then is, what has to be true at this point, at this point, and then likewise in the body of the else branch? And so it's clear that if we are get to this point to execute S1, E must hold because we took the then branch. Uh, and it's still the case that Q holds because our expressions here are pure and do not affect uh, the state. And when we're done, we know at least Q is going to be. We expect, sorry, uh, that R is going to hold here because R has to be our post condition after S1 this concludes, and so R should hold after S1. Likewise, in the else branch, we now know not E is true, and Q is true, and when we're done with S2, it better be the case that R holds. All right, and so we see this in the conditional rule on the slides again, that to prove that this if-then-else or triple is true, we need to prove that two other Hoare triples are true. We need to prove something about S1 and we need to prove something about S2. Our iteration rule says something about while loops. Right? And so now we have this interesting case of repetition and needing to know, well, we may go through this loop multiple times, executing S multiple times. What's going to be true and false before and after S through all these executions. All right, so that's the interesting trick here is that we have S and it happens a few times. And when we're done, we expect some value R to hold. And we also know that not E holds. Right? So the condition was false and so we, we fell out of the bottom. So at the beginning here, we know E holds, and so what is it that's going to be true after executing S? Well, it's hard to say. We don't know that our post condition is necessarily true, uh, and so what we end up coming to is looking for some loop invariant, some value, some expression that holds after every execution of the loop. And this loop invariant should be true at the beginning in the case we don't go through the loop at all. Uh, and we want it to be true at the end. Right, and so in the slide, our loop invariant is denoted by R. And we're saying that as long as the loop invariant holds at the beginning, right, so we're at some point, we have the loop invariant without going through the loop. We say while E. And so if E holds, then we go into the body. And so in the body, we know that E is true and the loop invariant is true. And so the thing we need to prove then above the bar here uh, makes a fair amount of sense, right? That if we're going to execute S in a while loop, we know that E has to hold. And so the idea is that the loop invariant continues to hold as we go through the loop multiple times perhaps indicating that we're getting closer and closer to a solution. Um, and it's only the combination of that loop invariant R and the negation of E that ends up uh, being true at the end. Right? And we'll see an application of this in the GCD proof in a little bit. Our last rule is the rule of consequence. And this is very useful. We need this to do basic reasoning about these expressions that are our pre and post condition. And so what we can do is two things. We can strengthen the precondition and weaken the post condition. Right? So we have some statement S, Q, 
is true at the end, r is true is our, is our precondition. And so if we have the case that r prime implies r, then we can go ahead and uh, prove this. Sorry, I have this backwards. Let me back up a step, right? So if r implies r prime, uh, then, and we can show that this Hoare triple with r prime and q prime holds, and also that q prime implies q, right? So this would be our q prime here, our r prime here. If q prime implies q, then it's also the case that q holds when we're finished. Uh, at the top, we're saying that r holds, and if r implies r prime, then r prime is true here. Right? We haven't done any work, we haven't computed any statements, executed any statements, but this is a way to sort of visualize what's happening in this rule of consequence. All right, so that's our brief tour of the rules. Uh, the next video we'll look at some examples of how we can use these. And we'll use these to generate proofs. And so the process then is to apply the rules and the axioms in such a way that we end up with a proof about the specification of a complete program. And we'll pick that up in the next video.